everybody. Welcome to the Fire It Up with CJ. Today we have Adia Harvey Wingfield, and she is talking about her book, Flatlining, Race, Work, and Healthcare in the New Economy. So welcome. Thank you. I'm excited to be here. Yeah. So this is like a very hot topic right now. There are so many interesting things happening right now in the world. Um, there's um, Biden who just elected all these incredible people of, of color to his administration. Um, there's sadly a lot of reports about the healthcare industry and people working within those industries as well as people of color having hardship with, um, with COVID. So there's so much to talk about. Um, I thought I'd let you start because I'm sure you're thinking a lot about all of these topics. What What's top of mind for you right now? Well, I guess when it comes to these issues of uh, race, work, health care in the context of COVID, uh, the things that I think about a lot have to do with the experiences that healthcare workers are facing right now. I mean, we've mm -hmm. talked a lot and had our attention drawn to the incredible strain that many of these workers are under. Uh, and I think the pandemic highlights that a lot of these strains are structural and they're not necessarily things that are brand new. These are issues that are highlighted and exacerbated by the tensions that COVID has brought in terms of who has access to health care, who has access to preventative care, uh, who is able to get treated by private insurers versus who has to rely on the emergency room for care the lengthy hours that our healthcare workers are expected to work, the often uh, disconnects between uh, scientific and medical knowledge and the ability and the ease with which falsehoods and misinformation can spread among the community, even when it's information that's not backed up by scientific knowledge. So I, I, I worry a lot about our healthcare workers and the ways in which they're coping and dealing with the strain that the, that the pandemic has provided. Okay, what I um, didn't know, because I haven't really, I've heard that there are a lot of healthcare workers that are having, you know, a lot of nurses, a lot of people who are in the support staff that are having a hardship during COVID. But what I don't have is, have is clear numbers. And so you had mentioned in your book, you know, like, I don't have a clear sense of what percentage of people are doing what kinds of work and how, how, what are the structural problems with even the hiring that's happening? Right. So when it comes to the numbers of where healthcare workers are represented, uh, so for one thing, we don't know exactly how COVID is, we don't have numbers documenting how COVID is impacting the ranks of our healthcare workers. We don't know, to my knowledge, uh, how many healthcare workers have been infected, how many have died directly as a consequence of COVID. And I think that in itself is a problem because it means there's a lack of information available about the specific impact this pandemic is having on our healthcare populations. My book focuses on the experiences of Black healthcare workers, and it was written and data were collected well before the pandemic happened. But even prior to the pandemic, uh, I knew that these were workers who were very, very well underrepresented in this field. Black doctors are about 5% of that profession. Uh, black nurses are about 10% of that profession. Uh, the numbers of physician assistants are a little bit higher, but these aren't areas where Black workers really reach parity. And one of the things that concerns me uh, are, has to do with the implications of that underrepresentation in an environment that's becoming increasingly racially diverse as our society is. Mm. What are the implications then? So 5% of the doctors, 10% of the nurses, a lot of the research study, I don't really even know to what extent they actually study specifically about people of color and like what black and, you know, Asian, like what, what, what are you, what are the implications? Well, one of the things that I found that I think is the most troubling from my data are that uh, black healthcare workers are in an environment where at a larger level, many organizations and the industry at large does acknowledge and talk about the importance of more racial diversity in the profession. And that's a good thing. We do want to recognize that that matters and that that's important. But I think what's also happened is that many organizations uh, have address the need for more racial diversity, but haven't necessarily devoted the funding, the resources, the attention, and the time towards actually achieving that outcome. And I think what they've done in place of that has been to leave a lot of the work of creating more racial diversity or making organizational spaces more accommodating to communities of color, that work has largely been left up to the few black healthcare workers that organizations do employ. So you find that doctors do a lot of work to try to reduce racial disparities and try to address issues of discomfort or doubts that patients of color may have about the healthcare system. 
Uh, black nurses do a lot to construct themselves as change agents who can really advocate for patients of color who are frequently overlooked or disbelieved in the healthcare system. Mm. Black technicians do a lot of that similar work. And to some degree, even that may not sound like such a big deal, right? You've got these populations of color who uh, have a particular insight into the experiences of patients of color. But what I found is that it ends up creating a situation where black doctors, nurses, and technicians end up doing what amounts to an additional job on top of the job that they are already hired to do, right? They're hired to be healthcare professionals. They're not hired to do this additional work of making sure that uh, certain communities get a certain level of attention or doing additional work to provide health cares or mentoring uh, doctors of color who are interested in coming into the field, but they're doing it on top of the already very long hours that they work in the profession in the first place. <laughs> I'm only laughing because I interviewed, um, I was coaching um, some women in the nonprofit community that were all people of color, all, all of different, different ethnicities. And um, it was, um, in in a lot of the nonprofit boards are predominantly run by not like of the boards are a lot of white men and um she was getting asked by several people to who are well intentioned wanting to know more about what is a person of color experience and she had said that it was very uncomfortable because so she was of indian descent and she said you know i i'm representing just me you know, and I have all of my particular biases. I'm like first generation, you know, I'm a woman, I'm like of India I, and, you know, I come from this part of India. It's like, it's so hard to generalize, like what is the Indian ex person of color experience? Now I'm supposed to be like the mascot, so to speak. She's like, I'm like someone's person of color spirit animal and like a guide, like I cannot do this. So people are coming to me and I really appreciate um, basically people asking me these questions to be informed and to know my opinion, but one, I feel very uncomfortable because I can't speak on behalf of all of people of color. Not, I mean, I can, I can, I'm, I'm, I have a lot of discomfort just talking about myself right. and representing, um, but then all these other things. So, um, it, and so I've seen that the one form that is taken is basically, you know, people realize that there's an effort and they want to be educated. And then the education that I see being provided is often um, shame-based and guilt-based. And then people have like white fragility all of a sudden associated with it. So um, have you seen some of these um, organizations, um, which are the glowing examples of how to do this in the best possible way? Or is there any, because <laughs> I haven't seen anything as, as, I don't even know. People are like, I don't even know if I'm counted as a person of color. People are like, you don't even count. So like that even in itself hurts. <laughs> but but what seems to be working? Yeah, so that's that's a great question. And pretty much every time I talk about the research in this book, someone says to me, so can you give us an example of a place that's doing this right? Or is there a shining beacon from your research? Yeah. And I wish I could say, you know, I spoke to this respondent who told me, you know, this place is really getting it right and they're doing the things that need to be done. That was not the case from my data. And that's not to say that there are not places out there that are, you know, doing an exemplary job. But I have to say, quite honestly, that when I spoke with respondents and I spoke with people in a variety of different healthcare facilities and a variety of different parts of the countries and different jobs in the healthcare industry, I personally did not speak with any respondents who described working in environments that they felt really had a solid handle on how to move the needle on these issues and how to do so in a way that didn't reproduce what I refer to in the book as this idea of racial outsourcing, what I was describing before, where organizations, again, shift this work onto workers of color in the organization. Now, that's not to say that there aren't things that organizations can do to avoid doing racial outsourcing. There is research that indicates that there are strategies that organizations can take that involve putting a lot of um, investment and responsibility in middle managers and in leadership, those who are in leadership roles and making sure that people are rethinking and being attuned to the processes that reproduce uh, racial disparities in organizations. A lot of that has to do with how organizations hire and the emphasis and reliance on internal social networks and drawing from say uh, people's existing relationships and friendships or a few colleges and universities that end up being kind of feeder institutions for certain places. Organizations can also rethink uh, how, they, uh, how mentoring structures are set into place and make sure that everybody has access to 
uh, mentors and uh, people who can serve in a mentoring relationship or even better who can serve as sponsors to help people advance through organizations. So there are things that the data indicate that organizations can do. I think ultimately though, there's a really big gap and a mismatch between what organizations can do and the evidence that's shown to work and what many organizations are doing, which is uh, engaging in patterns that are not shown to work. Mm, okay, what are patterns that don't, aren't shown to work? One is the whole um, racial outsourcing. So I will like take some person of color and hopefully they'll represent all people of color and can be like the spokesperson and then have two jobs in addition to their existing job. Okay, so that's racial outsourcing. What, and I, I can tell you from, um, that doesn't work. It's just having someone, unless you pay someone for two jobs, like, okay, right. maybe, but still, that's just a challenging thing. Um, what else doesn't work? Maybe that's another way of approaching if, if you can't find what does work, what doesn't work. Yeah, so that's a great question, too. Uh, and it, it may be somewhat counterintuitive or surprising to people, but we know from a pretty great deal of research that while diversity trainings have become a lot more common, the diversity industry is a multi-billion dollar industry, I think, at this point. Research has indicated that simply instituting diversity trainings in organizations has not really shown uh, to lead to progress in terms of advancing the numbers of workers of color or white women in leadership roles. And there are a couple of reasons for that. Uh, some of it has to do with backlash. People often uh, don't necessarily feel as though diversity trainings, particularly when they are mandatory, uh, are things that they support. Uh, it also has to do with how diversity trainings are frequently framed. There has been a move, uh, as one of my co colleagues in sociology, Frank Dobbin has pointed out, there's been a move from organizations focusing on affirmative action specifically and addressing racial and gender inequalities to diversity training writ large, which can include things as broad as diversity of regional background, diversity of viewpoints, diversity of thought. And those are ways for organizations to say that they are focusing on diversity, but also often what happens is that that type of attention obscures the ways that organizations are engaging in practices that marginalize workers of color and white women workers in their spaces. Another colleague of mine, Lauren Edelman, who's a sociologist at University of California, Berkeley, has pointed out that in many cases, organizations are really just less committed to trying to create more racial and gender diversity and more invested in showing that they are in compliance with existing regulatory structures. So organizations <laughs> aren't, in her view, necessarily really, necessarily really putting the effort and resources behind the types of strategies that we know do work, the focus on investing in middle management, rethinking uh, the hiring processes, rethinking mentoring structures, and are simply more focused on saying, well, we're doing something uh, because they know that being able to say that they're doing something keeps them in compliance and prevents them from uh, facing legal action. And more so, the, and the focus becomes more on that than on actually uh, creating strategies that will change. So in a nutshell, I would just say that when we think about what organizations are doing that does not work, diversity training is common, but it has not been shown to yield results. Organizations that focus on diversity without a specific intentional focus on race and gender and the ways that their internal practices may lead to more racial and gender inequality, that also is not a strategy for success. Mm -hmm. Organizations that focus heavily on compliance with regulatory structures and less on relying on, uh, again, those kinds of internal rethink rethinking those internal procedures are organizations that are not likely to see real, real successes and real changes happen internally. And you're measuring success based on the actual change in terms of what? Change of perspective, change of actual hiring? What are you looking at as your success, success yeah. metrics? So more so changes in representation, right? What we know, again, from a lot of organizations is that I think the typical, if you look at a typical organizational structure, what you will often find are uh, perhaps at some level, some racial diversity at the bottom level of an organizational structure. You find less and less the higher you go in that structure. So if you're looking at the middle to upper management level, if you're looking at the executive leadership level, what people might call the C-suite, these are the areas where you see the least amount of racial diversity and the least amount of gender diversity. And unfortunately, this is true across a number of fields. This is true in the tech industry. This is true in the financial industry. It certainly is true in the healthcare industry, which I spent a lot of time studying. Uh, so when I think, when we talk about how we want to see organizations change, 
it's very important to think about what that change can look like at the top levels of these organizations and these industries, because these are often where policies are set. These are how key and important decisions get made. These are where and how organizational culture gets shaped. And if those things are consistently being shaped by uh, people who are not members of racially diverse communities or people who have little exposure to racially diverse communities, then in my view, it becomes very difficult for those organizations to satisfactorily meet the needs of racially diverse communities mm. because there's too much of a gap and a mismatch between who is in charge of the organization and who that organization is, is supposed to be trying to reach. Okay, so let's just break this down into the very the three categories that you mentioned. So middle management. So one of the things that um, I've noticed in a lot of I'm, I'm, I work with a lot of nonprofits is that they basically are really, you know, hell bent to hire an executive director who is a person of color, primarily black, most of them, because they're working for those popu for that population. And they figure like that should be the representation of the person that heads a group. And oftentimes what I'm noticing is they they're for, first of all, there are very few number of people to find. So there's like a small number of people that are kind of circulating in the world of like, you know, nonprofit black leaders who know something about education. So first of all, there's like, you know, three or four people that are available. And then some of them are just not appropriate. Like they don't have the necessary skills that are needed to actually run an organization. So they're not, they, those, those leaders don't actually have the skill set that are needed. So in some ways, what it seems like is to prepare people of color to actually have those skill sets so that they are well positioned because just throwing a person of color into a position. So if someone said, okay, CJ, go become the president of this nonprofit just because I'm a person of color. I wouldn't necessarily know how to do that job well. So wh what does that mean about like training people so that they're ready and not just hiring because I have the right, you know, I have the right, shape eyes or something, you know, how, do, how does someone actually hire so that person can be successful in that job? Yeah, so that's a great question. And that has to do with what we refer to often in the social sciences and in sociology as the pipeline issue, right? And mm -hmm. that's an issue that I think many industries have grappled with to some degree, right? Part of the problem is that if we want to see more racial diversity, uh, at upper and middle management levels of organizations, there have to be people from whom organizations can draw. We wanna see a robust body of people who are available to move into these roles. But to me, that speaks a lot to the importance of making sure that from a broad sense, organizations writ large are working on kind of creating and developing talent in a racially diverse fashion in the first place, right? Because often we, in many cases, I think don't see organizations taking that approach of wanting to build from the ground up. We see a lot more of what you described, organizations wanting to bring in kind of uh, one Import of the, someone. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Wherever I don't know where from. <laughs> exactly, right? And I think this is the tendency to think about in any particular field, who are the five or 10 people of color who are superstars in that field, who are well-known that kind of everybody fights over because they are well-known and they are superstars, right? And I think, again, in many industries, that's been the approach. And when organizations follow that path, Sure, then it's easy to say, well, you know, we can't find anybody. We asked, you know, two of these five people who were superstars and they both said no because they had 10 other offers. But part of where organizations can change is by making sure that they are places where they can cultivate growth among people who aren't necessarily at that top level yet, but have the potential to get there. And that's part of why these mentoring strategies and initiatives are so important because often people need that guidance. They need the support. They need someone to advocate for them. They need someone to show them the ropes. But when there are racial mismatches in mentoring strategies and, so, and sponsor strategies, which often is what ends up happening, people stall out and they don't necessarily have the tools and the social capital to advance further because they're not getting the support and guidance. Mm, okay, so you mentioned two important things tool in the mentoring as tools and social capital, which is, I, I get, but for people who may not know those terms, tell us a little bit about what specific tools. So, let, so okay, so I have, two questions related to that. So, okay, you have this pipeline issue. And so you really want to hire an executive director who's a person of color. No one is around. And, you know, and the person who they would like to have cultivated is not ready yet. So what, what's a viable strategy to use so that you actually have a, a, 
the voice of the population of the people that you serve, but then also the skill set of someone who actually has that skill set and can kind of groom the people at the lower levels to move up. What, aside from mentoring, I mean, what what do you do? Or how what should you wait and wait to hire the executive director that is a person of color? I, I mean, how, what does the organization do? Yeah, so that's a great question too. And it may be in this hypothetical setting, it may be that. At this particular time, it may not be the moment to hire this particular person of color, right? And it may mean that hiring a person of color is not feasible at that point in time. But what I think is really important to stress is that organizations, in my view, want to be thinking about the long term, right? There may not be a person right now who fits your needs for that leadership role who is a person of color, but are you thinking long term about how you want to grow the field and make sure that there are people of color who are coming up who may not necessarily even be a perfect fit for your organization, but people that you can hire and train in your organization so that they can be a fit, if not for yours, for others, right? And I think if many organizations think that way, then they're really developing this pipeline and they are cultivating and they are building a new generation of leaders that's going to be better equipped for organizations of the future to be able to have more racial diversity at those top ranks. And again, I just think it's really important to draw this back to thinking about where the country is going, right? We know now, for example, that millennials are the largest generation. Uh, they've surpassed, they have surpassed the baby boomers as the largest, uh, the largest generation that we've had in recent history, right? We also know that they are a lot more racially diverse than previous generations. There are a lot more millennials who are identifying as multiracial. Asian, uh, Latin Amer- La- excuse me, Latinos are now the largest group of color in the US. Asian Americans are the fastest growing group of color. So what we are facing as a country is an increasingly racially diverse society, right? Mm -hmm. And these are the people who are going to be leading our organizations in the future. These are the people who are going to be the managers Mm -hmm. in our future. We don't serve ourselves well as a country if we're not training these populations well and we are not giving them the support and the tools that they need to take on these leadership roles because we're too stuck in the demographic models of the past that did not necessarily have as much racial diversity as we do now. Got it. So the so mentoring is really important. So training and 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 mentoring, or are those two separate things? Or is that one and the same thing in in your mind? The kind of getting you know training so that you're trained up to move up the rank, which everyone needs, right? And then also mentoring. How are those two things different? And you said that there's social capital, and what kind of specific tools would you be looking for in a mentoring program? Yeah, so I, I, I probably am throwing out way too many technical terms <laughs> at our discussion, but uh, it's great to distinguish between these two because they're related, but not necessarily synonymous, right? So if we're talking about training, then I think that's speaking pretty broadly about making sure that people have the technical skills and the capacity to either fill the requirements of the job that they are in or thinking about jobs that they may want to hold in the future. Mentoring is a little bit different because if we're talking about mentoring, we're talking about people having access to someone in their organization or outside of their organization who can give them particular direct specialized feedback about something that they're working on or advice about particular steps they may take in their career and so forth. But even apart from mentoring, we also wanna think about sponsoring, which is an entirely different term. And sponsorship refers to the person who is positioned in an organization and has the ear of people who are very influential and can advocate for someone in that room, right? So when I think about people, when I think about my own career, uh, my graduate program provided me with the training to be a sociologist and to carry out research studies and to uh, create research designs for projects and so forth. My mentors have been people that I've gone to to be able to say, you know, I'm thinking about this idea for this project. Does it make sense? How would you change it? Could you take a look at this grant proposal for me? Could you read this article for me and give me some feedback before I send it in? Mentors will do things like that. But sponsors are people like the dean at my university or perhaps the provost at my university who are in meetings that I don't even get invited to and don't even know about <laughs> right. because of the level that they're in. And those are the people who will say, you know, we're thinking about somebody who might want to be on this important committee. We really should turn to Adia because she is a person that we'd really want to get in this type of work. And she's a person whose feedback we want to have. I really think we should recommend her for this important leadership role because she's a person that we wanna keep an eye on. And I think when we think about those three categories, there's breakdowns at each level, right? I think it's 
broadly available for people of color and for white women to have access to training that they need in certain mm -hmm. jobs. Mm -hmm. Having access to mentors is where we start to see more diminishment and mm -hmm. having access to sponsors is even more critical. And that's where we start to see even more dwindling and more of a mismatch because people of color and women who are often underrepresented in certain fields are even less likely to have access to the people who are the sponsors who can put forth their names and suggest them for really important and critical leadership roles that are often a feeder for advancement. Mm, yeah, because those things are oftentimes happened informally, right? I play basketball with those guys. I remember I was in uh, um, at Microsoft in a high tech community, and you know there are guys who are at the same level as I was who who were playing basketball with you know the VPs and the executive VPs and have having access that I, unless I played basketball, which I don't, and I'm not a guy, I would never actually be able to get. And, and those kind of informal friendships, and I see you hanging out on the basketball court, we're in the gym, we're talking about, like, did you see the whatever, like those kinds of things didn't happen for me. Right. And they happened for my male counterparts. And so, so it, it kind of happens informally. How do you get a program like that in an organization where is it just basically saying, okay, you need to sponsor this person or how does one implement something like that? Yeah, well, I think what you've just identified is part of the problem, right? That in many cases, these mentoring and sponsorship relationships are very informal and they're very yeah. off the books and they're not structured by organizations. They happen by happenstance, right? So someone who's in a middle management position uh, hire someone and they think, well, that person reminds me of me. They are a lot like I was when I was at this age. Let me make sure that I'm available to them. Uh, if the person is a sponsor, they have, they recognize that there's a common ground. Maybe they play basketball, like you said, with this person. And so that person is on their mind when it comes to recommending somebody for a, poten a, a potential position. I think there's room for organizations to change and uh, institutionalize in some ways mentoring and sponsorship programs so that they are more broadly and widely applicable to, to more workers, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that there are ways for organizations to make sure that they are opening, say, mentoring programs that might exist to everybody rather than having people uh, have to take the step of signing up for a mentoring program, taking the step of simply making sure that everyone has a mentor, right? Making sure that people are assigned to people who can be mentors and who can work with them in an organization so that no one gets inadvertently left out of that process and no one gets inadvertently inadvertently excluded, right? Taking opportunities like that to make sure that people aren't just left to their own devices to gravitate towards those to whom they would otherwise be attracted to anyway, right? But making right. sure that there are specific programs and initiatives in place where people have to connect with people who may seem different from them because that gives an opportunity to learn more about those people, to see more of their skill sets, to see more of the advantages that they may bring to a position. And these are things that may not necessarily be immediately apparent, right? So even in your own example of not being a, a basketball player, yeah. I think there are ways to envision how not having that particular uh, athletic interest might have been alleviated were you matched with someone who could see, well, sure, CJ doesn't play basketball. She's not on the court with me on a regular basis, but getting to know her, I'm aware that she has these particular leadership interests and I'm aware that she has these particular skills. And now that I know this, I know that this is a person that I'm going to be working with to uh, work on this particular project, or this is a person who would be really good for this particular team that's going to provide a great opportunity. But right. those in, those connections have to be nurtured and they have to be uh, intentionally put into place through organizations. Otherwise, again, I think they just don't happen on their yeah, own. Yeah, they don't have, what's so frustrating, honestly, when I listen to this is that it should actually be everyone has equal opportunity to have like mentorship and sponsorship. And, and the problem is, is now then like, so I actually think of my eldest son who is a Eurasian, part Jewish, part Chinese guy who's interested in getting into high tech. Yeah, good luck. Like, it's like you're you're not the you're first of all you're not the right person of color, and you know you're a guy, so it's it's actually very hard. So when he gets into these, you know, when you go to places at Microsoft, they are actually putting together these mentoring programs. I'm actually coaching some people who are part of these mentoring groups, and but then then also the person who you know quiet Asian guy doesn't have a mentoring group because they're like, well, what, whatever, like you figure it out. So it's, it's a, it's a really challenging scenario, I think, in, 
in all of these cases. And I can make a case like, well, yeah, you've had all these opportunities, you know, and people have not, other people have not. So they need to actually, you know, grow the ranks and not have this pipe, you know, pipeline issue. But it's a very tricky problem because in some ways, the problem that you were saying, like the, the diversity tra training is about like, you know, just equal rights for everyone, but then it becomes, I, I don't know how to handle that kind of scenario. And I now see it from my own side and I see it from my son's side. How, how do you think about those issues? Yeah, so it's interesting that you mentioned your son and his interest in the, the tech industry, because I have a colleague, <clears throat> excuse me, Koji Chavez, who's at Indiana University, who's done some work on Silicon Valley and the hiring process there and the ways that aspects of the hiring process still embed into them discriminatory ideas about Asian Americans. He found that more often than not, uh, discriminatory ideas about Asian Americans tied back to ideas about culture and tied back to ideas about fit in ways that were linked to whether people were US born Asian Americans or born outside of the country, right? So in many cases, the short version of his findings were that for people who were Asian American, but first or second generation, uh, who had been who had been born in the country, there was more of a perception that they'd be more likely to fit into teams and to be better hires than people who perhaps uh, were Asian American but immigrated and had perhaps attended college outside of the U.S. in China, Japan. Uh, South yeah, like my parents. Those would have yeah. been my parents. Yeah, and it would have right. been hard. But so, yeah, it's just it's hard to. There's so many. Um, there's so many issues in all these different directions. So if you actually offer for women, people of color, these kind of sponsorship and mentorship programs, and what does that mean for everyone else? You know, I don't, I don't yeah. know. So, well, and so I think one of the things that comes out of my research is that, uh, so my focus in the book is on black professional workers, but we right. know from the literature on work and the race in the workplace uh, more generally, that these issues around race, and these issues around gender aren't exclusive to black workers, right? And that was one of the things that I found so interesting about your comment just now about your son's experiences and what his experiences will look like in the tech industry. Research indicates uh, that while Asian American workers may be overrepresented relative to their numbers in professional managerial jobs at entry to middle levels, they're actually pretty underrepresented again, when it comes to leadership positions and executive jobs. So what that might mean theoretically for your son might be access to a tech job might not be super difficult, but if he's interested in moving up the ranks and getting to a leadership position, chances are there are probably going to be some challenges in store for him, again, because of the ways in which patterns of bias and discrimination manifest for Asian Americans. Yeah. So what does that mean to your question? If it means, if, if we're looking at a situation where there are opportunities put forth for some groups that try to address these, these concerns, I think that on some level, organizations also want to be attuned to potential backlash, right? And they want to be yeah. aware of the fact that they're are, and this is, has been the case, this isn't a new issue. There are and have been people who uh, respond with frustration and feel excluded and feel that it seems unfair to think about uh, these types of initiatives. That That's the backlash that you're referring yeah, exactly. to. So you're yeah. categorizing as backlash. Yeah, okay, right. got it. Exactly. That people may feel frustrated by this attention to the experiences that workers of color have. But again, we also have to put that into the bigger context and thinking about the fact that again, these are groups that are underrepresented in these leadership positions and have been for a very long time. And there are reams of data that point to the systemic processes that leave out these workers and make and create additional difficulties for them when it comes to advancing. Workplaces yeah. do not benefit in the long term and in the bigger picture from these kinds of racial and gender disparities, particularly at their top levels. So from an organizational standpoint, it is to the organization's benefit. And it's really, in my view, to all of our benefit to have right. work environments where we benefit from the full range of human experience. We lose so much by people being marginalized and excluded from opportunities because of race or gender, because we don't get a chance to benefit from the human capital and the skill that people can bring in those spaces. Yeah, it's just the backlash, how to deal with the backlash, right? And the backlash looks so different, right? So either people who are resentful that certain people have certain privileges that other people don't, or I've actually seen um, a lot of the people who are millennials that are early, like um, young stage millennials who feel guilty for just being, having privilege. Like I don't even, I shouldn't even talk. So I actually have had people who are in meetings um, in, in, 
and they feel like they can't even talk, like they shouldn't even talk because I'm a white man of privilege. So now I can't even talk. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> which I thought, well, that that's, and it's not even a backlash. It's more like a, I feel so guilty and shameful for having all this privilege that I'm not even going to participate in the meeting, even though he has a lot of interesting things to say. I don't even know what to say to someone who has that idea because as you said all perspectives are important so i don't I, where do you think something like that would be coming from because you know i know at least with the younger generation um it's kind of millennials it's like you've been trained to like be quiet you've had privilege just your voice does not need to be heard mm -hmm. to this gentleman who is my age who's also works in a nonprofit, and he's kind of been trained the same way what what to say to, to folks who have this scenario Right. Well, certainly, I think in some cases there are there's definitely utility in some settings to listening and to learning from what other people have to say. Right. So I don't want to <laughs> suggest to give the idea that, you know, people should just talk all the time, even if it's an area where they don't know as much or have as much experience. There certainly is some utility to just listening to what other groups, particularly groups who have frequently been silenced or disenfranchised have to say. But we also, I think you're right, want to figure out a way to balance that ability to listen with the ability to contribute, right? And I, again, think that when organizations find this balance, and it is difficult, it's not an easy thing to do and it requires a lot of work and time and investment. But I think when organizations find this balance of being able to be places that encourage and speak to and support uh, communities of color in a way that allows them to contribute fully to the organization's mission and purpose and goals, and does so in a way that recognizes that this balance is necessary for how to operate in a multiracial liberal democracy, right? That mm -hmm. we have to be able to hear all voices. We have to be able to encourage people to be silent when they need to hear what others are saying, but not to be so silent that they never contribute. And that part of that is the process that the organization has to take in order to maximize its voices from all members. Then I think, again, you end up ultimately with stronger organizations because they're Absolutely. drawing from the, the viewpoints and from the experiences of all their members. Yeah, it's just a hard, I think we're in this muddy middle. Like no one knows we don't, we haven't necessarily set out what the right thing to do is. Just as you were saying, we know a lot of wrong things or things that don't work as effectively, but we don't have the right thing. So as we try to figure that out, people are like, you know, either shutting themselves up or, you know, not knowing what to do. I have someone who is interested in taking this like high level position, but she feels guilty because it's supposed to be for a person of color, but they can't find the person of color. And so I'm like, why can't you be grooming someone to right. take that role? And she's like, yeah, but that's not, you know, so it's all these well-intentioned situations, but people not like, they don't know exactly what the right thing to do. And it's not even a fr white fragility thing. It's just, there's not a clear sense of what the right thing is to do. And there's not enough dialogue because people feel uncomfortable to even have a dialogue about it. Right. Do you know what I mean? Like, am mm -hmm. I talking too much? Am I not? You know, that's a, it's an uncomfortable thing to talk about. So it's, it's, it's a very challenging time, I think, right now for people who really want to fulfill the intention of hearing all perspectives, but are not sure what to do. Yeah, you know? no, it's definitely true. I uh, So I, I've written about this actually, and I'm already experiences about this as a sociology department for the Harvard Business Review. Uh, I wrote a piece uh, earlier this year called We Built a Diverse Department in Five Years, Here's How. And one of the things that I talked about were the specific steps that we took as a department to get to a place where of our faculty, uh, the time that I wrote it, about half of our faculty are faculty of color. And if you look at our leadership ranks, those who are full professors in the department, uh, half of us were people of color and of the a, a large majority of the half of us were women of color, which I think is pretty much wow. unprecedented. <laughs> yeah, I think that's unprecedented in most- At, at Harvard or, wa or Wash U? This is at, wa at Wash U. Yeah, okay. I wrote the piece for the Harvard Business Review. Yeah, okay, got uh, it. Our experiences at Wash U. But one of the things that I talk about in that piece has been that we've been very explicit and intentional about wanting to make sure that we had a racially diverse department and that we had a lot of balance at both ranks and that it wasn't a place where we had some assistant professors who are untenured and thus more, more vulnerable 
uh, in the university structure who were people of color, but then that we had all white workers at the full professor rank of the senior leadership in the department, in other words. So yeah. we were very intentional and deliberate about trying to make sure that this was something that we did intentionally and on purpose. But interestingly, that hasn't meant that, it, so I, I mentioned that and I mentioned how we've also been attuned to our department culture and how it's been a culture where we do talk openly and explicitly about racial issues. But that hasn't meant that everybody that we've hired has been someone who is either a person of color or who focuses directly on these issues of race. I have colleagues for whom these issues of race are central to their church. What that's meant for us as a department though, we know that these are conversations that we can have. We know that these are discussions that we're willing to have. And we know that having these discussions is necessary as part of our mission and our goal and who we want to be as a department. And I think that just goes back to what you're saying about figuring out this delicate balance of when to speak and who gets to speak and how people figure out where they want to talk and when they want to talk and what they want to say. It is an ongoing process, but it's a process that I think has to be done deliberately and intentionally with an eye towards making sure that as a place that I would consider racially or, or color conscious as opposed to colorblind, we are mm. aware that this is a part of who we are as a department. It's a thing that we want to address directly and head on, but it doesn't become uh, the entirety of who and what we are as a department. Yeah, that's exactly, that's yeah. exactly what the, the key is, is it, it, if it becomes like that's your whole motive is to like basically hear only one person's perspective and no one else. And it, then to me, that's, there's something a little bit contorted about that as well. And I'm wondering, like in your group meetings, is a part of it is because there's something about the facilitative process during the meeting where everyone feels that they can talk. Is that, is, how was that engendered? Yeah, so I get, so the history of our department is, it's kind of interesting. It's a relatively new department. We're only about five years old. And I was actually hired in the first round of people to, who were hired to come in and help build the department. So when I came in, I was hired with two other colleagues, both of whom were white men. And the three of us were basically the department. We had a department chair uh, who was from the economics department, who also was a white man. Uh, so that first year that I was here, it was, me as the only woman, only person of color, and uh, three other white men in the room for making all of our decisions. And I write in the piece that I remember vividly many occasions when I would look around the room and I would think, this is the last year that this room looks like this because there's no way we're gonna continue building a department where I'm the only one, that's just, that's not acceptable. Right. But what really was significant and important was that my senior colleagues shared that view as well. I wasn't the only one who felt that way. Mm. I said that openly in meetings. But they also would say, yeah, you know, you're right. We, we can do better than this. We're going to do better than this. We're not going to be that department. Where... So it's an intention and it's an intentional yeah. thing. But in the dialogue, were they like, well, what do you think? I mean, or, I mean, was it, were they like facilitative in terms of like getting your perspective? And was it your perspective or your perspective as as the community of color representing? What, what was it? Were you... Uh, uh, racial outsourcing kind of perspective, like how did it work so that so it That's a great question. Well. One of the things that I think mattered was that when I was hired, I came in at a leader in, in the, as a senior person. So I came in at the rank of full professor, which meant that I wasn't worried about getting tenure. I wasn't worried to get, about getting promoted. Those things that already happened. And I was mm. at the top of the promotion ladder. And I think that really gave me the ability to speak freely and openly about everything that I felt. And my coworkers were not people who put me in that position of, you know, tell us what the black community thinks or speak right. to us about what uh, women think and be that person who's a representative. I certainly thought about those issues, but I wasn't ever put in a position where I was asked to be that person to represent this entire, this entire right. group. And I think what that meant because of the colleagues that did come in with me and because we were so focused on making sure that we could build a department that would be not just diverse, but inclusive was that we were very attuned mm. and we continue to be attuned when we have faculty meetings about making sure that we encourage, we wanna hear everybody's point of view. We want everybody, mm. we want that to, we wanna get viewpoints from our colleagues of color, from our white colleagues, from our junior colleagues, from our senior colleagues, but it's a very intentional process of making sure that everybody feels a part of the department mm -hmm. and that they are able to voice their opinions and their viewpoints. And, but is that, so how does that go? Is that consistent with this kind of compliance? I mean, it's not, it's not compliance, but um, 
what you said is it's inclusion. That was the high value that you guys had as a group is it's important to hear everyone's perspective and no one is particularly more important than other, but you all have the intention to have a more diverse group. That was the, the value and the intention was really important. But then I, I wonder how that fits in with the comment you made about before about diversity training, where it's like all our voices are important. And does that, how does that water things down? Yeah, so I think the challenge with diversity training is when people are brought in to do trainings and the focus is on uh, diversity of thought or diversity of opinion, right? So when organizations say, we wanna be focused on uh, diversity, this is important to us, but the way that we're going to go about achieving is achieving this is to make sure that we have a broad array of different viewpoints and a broad array of different points of view and thoughts and perspectives that people have. What research has shown is that organizations that take that approach often end up reproducing racial disparities because you can hire a bunch of white men from different parts of the country who oh. uh, are, you know, from different religious backgrounds or who have different tastes in sports. Uh. Okay, okay. We did it. We look at this d diverse department that we built. I see. So. Oh, okay. From San Francisco and Marcus from Florida. Great work. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I had, I, I, all right. So that really is different because you're basically saying as long as you have different people from different countries, that's diverse enough, right. which that is not diverse enough. I get it. Okay. But because I think the, the positive thing is I want to hear everyone's point of view. I want to hear different perspectives. That sounds like very similar to the thing that was happening in your department. So that is okay. It's just don't think that if you have diverse idea, thoughts that that's enough. You know, if you have like six white guys from all over the country, that's not diverse enough. Okay. I get that now. All right. So then hiring structures. Um, what and internal practices, what specifically do you look at with that? So what does it mean a hiring structure and recruiting? Like, what does that look like? Yeah, so with academic hiring, uh, the way that it ends up happening is that you start with a super long list of uh, people who have applied for the positions. You call it down to a long short list and then call it down to an even shorter list of people that you fly out for, for interviews. Right. What we wanted to do was actually start before the application process with mm -hmm. thinking about the hires. And we wanted to start by making sure that we had a diverse pool of applications of people who applied for the job in the first place. And mm -hmm. so what that meant was reaching out to people who we could encourage either to apply or people who could um, use their networks to help create a diverse applicant pool. And we did that in a couple of ways that I think were really valuable and have implications for, for organizations. One, we didn't just reach out to people that we knew from graduate school or people who were in networks that tended to be disproportionately white. We reached out to organizations that we know directly reach many communities of color. So there are listservs, professional associations that work with communities of color and that have sociologists of color. We made it a point to reach out to those and say, you know, we're going to have an open position. We'd like to post this on your listserv. Mm. We'd really like to have people in your organization apply. But even past that, we also took direct steps of contacting potential applicants directly and saying to people, particularly candidates of color, we're going to have this position open up. We've been looking at your work. We think you'd be a great candidate. Please think about applying for, for our position. And this is a step that I think translates outside of academia to organizations at large. I think often, again, organizations are really focused in many ways on, like I said, reaching the five or 10 people who are superstars of color and just yeah. fighting for those people and tossing those people a bunch of offers and money and things like that. That's great for those five people. That might not be so great for the other 50, 100 people who are people of color in that field who aren't considered kind of those key superstars, right? So we wanted to make sure that we were directly seeking out people who might potentially apply for our position who otherwise either might not have seen the announcements or might have overlooked us for whatever reason. So we directly asked people, we directly contacted people, mentioned that we knew about their work, let, asked them to let us know if they had questions or concerns. In other words, we specifically recruited a bunch of people to apply for the position so that we would have a racially diverse applicant pool. Right. And then from there, at each stage of culling the list further, we would double check ourselves and we would make sure, okay, we've got this long short list, but we wanna make sure we don't have a long short list of 10 candidates who are all white, right? We can't go mm. from 300 applicants, which includes 
people of color to a long short list that's only 10 white candidates. We can't go from mm. this to a short list of people that we fly out that's five white candidates, right? There's no reason for that to, to happen as we winnow down the list. So it involved um, direct outreach. It involved being very reflect, reflexive and intentional about diversity. It involved making sure that we were trying to build as much of a diverse pool as possible from start to finish. And the end result was that we ended up, uh, so I mentioned by my first year, it was me and three other white men and that was the entirety of the department. By the second year, we hired two white women and one black man. So our numbers had completely shifted around. We've continued along that pattern to the point where now, as I said, in a department of 13 people, about half of us are people of color. So we've wow. gone from me being the only one <laughs> to half of us being, uh, rep to half of a department being represented by communities of color. And I'm just curious from your own felt experience, being in a room from being like the one person of color with three white men to now half, how does it actually feel differently for you? I've, I've never been in a situation like that, so I can't even tell you how it would feel. Isn't that sad? Right. <laughs> well, what does it feel right. like when you have right. diversity? <laughs> right. I mean, unfortunately, your experience, I think, is more common than mine. Most departments, most workspaces, particularly professional workspaces, look like that. So. It's been really, it, it's really been great. I feel really proud to have played a part in helping to build the department, yeah. get the department to this place. But also part of what I like a lot about it is knowing that, again, we're doing our part to help build this pipeline. We are developing this community of sociologists of color who have the potential to go on, not necessarily outside of WashU, I don't want any of them to leave, certainly, but they have the potential to be people who can take on administrative roles, people who can yeah. be in high ranking positions in university settings and in university structures and really be influential in changing the way that these organizations work so that they can be more open and available to broad communities of color. Okay, but my question is for you, maybe it's too personal, but how does it feel different for you when you're in a meeting, like if you contrast the meetings before and then and now, is there, how does it feel differently? That's a good question. I think that it feels different to the extent that it feels more comfortable in some ways. And it's not that I was complete, it's not that I was primarily uncomfortable in the department meetings that that first year. Again, we were a right. new department and we were getting off the yeah. ground. But I also have to say that a lot of my levels of comfort early on had to do with the fact that my colleagues that I hired, that, excuse me, my colleagues that I came that, that I came in with also recognize that this was an issue and this was a thing that needed to change. It's not hard at all to imagine that had other colleagues in my field been hired, there would have been a very stark contrast between my early experiences in the department and where we've gotten to now, or that we might not even have gotten to the place that we are right, now. Right, you all came in with the shared value and right. mission, which is, is now continued, but is it, yeah, and maybe it's too hard to answer because I, I don't, I literally haven't been in a meeting where I have several, I know what it's like to be with my Asian friends. There's just this kind of shortcut where I don't feel like people, I'm like, you know what I mean? They're like, yeah, we know what you mean. <laughs> like, it's just like this kind of, but I don't even, I, I, I wonder if when I was in a work experience, if I had that shared camaraderie, if I'd feel even more comfortable to share ideas that I wouldn't have shared otherwise, or if that's just that comfort led to, I don't know, more creativity. I just don't really know what it, what it means. Cause as you said, the, 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 in theory, everyone can save their more perspectives. It prevents, presents like a better outcome, a better, um, work product and a better representation because what you're creating represents the public. Mm -hmm. So I can understand that in theory. I'm just wondering what it's like in practice. Like why does that, I know that you hear different voices, therefore it's better, but is there a different experience going to work when you feel that you're among other people of color or community yeah, of well, color? So I think there is some work that is not my own research, but I think that being in more racially diverse environments for workers can often lead to more of a sense of authenticity in the workplace, right? It can lead to more of a, to less, to lower feelings of stress and a heightened sense of authenticity in the sense that workers feel like they're able to bring their whole self into the workplace in ways that aren't necessarily the case when they are 
very much underrepresented or when they're in the, in the yeah market. okay yeah. that would make sense that makes sense to me well even just I, was, I have a client who works in the consulting industry which is predominantly white male and she's like I always have to pretend I'm not who I am because I have to fit into the culture which is not you know I'm not an Ivy League white man. And so I, I always feel a little bit out of sorts when I'm in these meetings, like I can't be myself. And literally who she is outside of the meeting and who she is in the meeting, like they were two different people. So she had to like, just, I guess I am imagining like, and if I use her example, it's like she has to be like in an acting role, right. like, and actually thinking of creative, smart ideas and participating in addition to acting the role of your life, you know, right. versus just being herself. So I can see the authenticity piece. Okay. So internal, any other internal practices or have we mentioned them all? So you had said that um, we talked about um, middle management, mentoring, which breakdowns to training mentors and sponsorships, um, hiring practices, and then internal practices. Are there any other internal practices that we haven't mentioned that are important for companies? Yeah, I think the only other thing I would suggest is that organizations, <clears throat> excuse me, should be mindful of the organizational culture that they have, right? And this is another somewhat more intangible aspect of what workplace life is like, but it's no less important, particularly for workers of color. If there is a culture uh, that feels inhospitable, unwelcoming, exclusionary to workers of color, it's far less likely that they're going to be able to perform their best and do their best and to thrive at that, that workplace. And some of how that culture gets reproduced, again, can go back to um, social dynamics that are present in a place. The example that I always give is that if you have an organization and the annual retreat is done at a former plantation, you're establishing, <laughs> you're establishing a culture that's not going to go over well for many of your employees of color. And they may not say that openly. They may not be in a position to say, this isn't working for me. But I feel confident that I can say with some certainty that holding your annual retreat at a former plantation is not a good look in this day and age. It's not a good way of establishing an organizational culture that's inclusive and, and welcoming, right? Please, and please tell me that, that someone didn't actually do that. Is this a true story? Uh, I would like to tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Wow. Okay. <laughs> Well, okay. So actually being more, um, thinking about your cultural values and making yeah. sure that it's consistent in alignment with all of your practices and being sensitive like that to me is just someone who's just insensitive. I don't even, I can't even explain what would cause so much. That's beyond cultural values. <laughs> that's just like courtesy and just consciousness. I don't even be on culture. Wow. Okay. Sorry, but is there anything else? <laughs> respect to internal practice <laughs> no i think that's the main thing okay that I, into that. Uh, I i um your book couldn't have been more perfectly timed in a world where people are really struggling to know what the right thing is a lot of like you know i'm in seattle so we have a lot of well-intentioned nonprofit companies i i've even thought about applying for some of these diversity equity inclusion because it's something that i care dearly about and there are like a thousand jobs out there for the, it, it's such a hot topic and people are so confused. And like I was saying, just not doing any of these things very well. And so it's really nice to actually have someone who has the academic research grounded in research on what kinds of practices actually work. So um, we've been talking to Adia Harvey Wingfield about her book, uh, flatlining race work and healthcare in the new economy thank you so much thank you thanks for having me on